Only 5% of patients nationally enroll in clinical trials. And in our hands, 66% of our glioblastoma patients are enrolled in clinical trials. And the rationale to do that is observe patients do better. They get more care, they get more oversight, complications are seen more quickly. So patients enrolled in clinical trials have better outcomes, even if they get a placebo. Welcome to 20 Minute Health Talk. I'm your host, Rob Hoyle. While we don't often think about clinical trials and their impact on our health, the COVID vaccines have put a spotlight on their importance. Our guest today is a major proponent of clinical trials and has been internationally recognized for his research in brain tumors and stem cell biology throughout his 20-year career. Dr. John Bookvar is the Vice Chair of Neurosurgery, Director of the Brain Tumor Center at Lenox Hill, and Director of the Laboratory for Brain Tumor Biology and Therapy at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. Dr. John Bookvar, thank you so much for joining us here on 20 Minute Health Talk. Uh, why such an emphasis on research? Is research something that you've always been interested in? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on this great podcast. And um, I think it's a very important topic to talk about why clinical research is important. I think as all of us have endured this uh, pandemic over the last year and a half, we realized that research really has saved humanity. And if it was not for the courage of both the researchers like Kate Carrico, um, who developed the mRNA vaccine for BioNTech, who I know personally from my days at the University of Pennsylvania, for her perseverance in clinical research, and for the volunteers who participated in the clinical research trials, um, we would have had a very different uh, ending of this uh, pandemic. So we saw firsthand last year and this year now um, exactly what you suggest is the importance of clinical research, funding clinical research scientists, uh, efforts like we have at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research uh, really will save humanity. And I guess there's a lot of things that are learned during clinical trials and probably some things that weren't expected to be learned. You know, my father died of cancer 10 years ago, and he actually died during the last pandemic, um, which was uh, the H1N1 <coughs> uh, swine flu um, pandemic. And he, he was in the middle of chemotherapy. And, um, you know, I think as a, a care provider and as a patient, having even just a shoulder to cry on um, and the more people around you, um, the better it is. And you, you get that when you're involved in a clinical trial. I see so many patients from small uh, rural areas across the country who are dying from their glioblastomas and they're alone. They have no access uh, to a clinical trials office. My research coordinators, my data managers, my nurse practitioners, my RNs, my PAs, my residents, my fellows, there's always someone there for our patients. And I think that's an sort of an invaluable resource. Yeah. And I would assume that clinical trials, you know, they, they make great improvements to healthcare, right? I mean, it, so much good can come out of a clinical trial. Listen, we see it every day on Twitter and in the newspapers, um, whether it's Johnson & Johnson or BioNTech or Moderna. I mean, every day, AstraZeneca yesterday with its COVID antibodies, every day. It all comes from clinical trials. Yeah, I mean, it's a 180 character tweet today, mm -hmm. but it took about a decade's worth of research at least. So, Dr. Bookvar, tell us about some of your clinical trials and what you focused on over the years. Well, I started. I, I came out of the University of Pennsylvania uh, with an interest in um, stem cell biology and brain tumors and some fine sort of uh, molecular biology of of the cell signaling. And so, I started early looking at uh, targets. And one of the targets was a protein called epidermal growth factor receptor. So I started early in my career when I started at Cornell looking at small molecules. But as we've talked about, those molecules really, 98% of small molecules, even though they're small, don't get through the blood-brain barrier. So I very quickly realized that that was not a great avenue. You know, it may, it may get you sort of a Nobel Prize in medicine when you're looking at the um, the the let's say crystallizing a, a protein, but it's not going to help my patient who has a blood brain barrier. So I quickly pivoted with the help of some colleagues in trying to understand the blood brain barrier. That's where my focus has been. Uh, 
at the Feinstein Institutes and at, at Lenox Hill Hospital, Northwell Health, we're world leaders in something called intraarterial drug delivery for brain tumors. Uh, we just published our large phase two results in the Journal of Neurooncology uh, last week. Um, and we will be the lead site for a phase three randomized controlled trial looking at selective intraarterial drug delivery to bypass the blood brain barrier for patients with glioblastoma. So that should open in 2022. And um, that's really where my focus has been. When we talk about the blood brain barrier, what is the blood brain barrier and why is it also, it, why does it, it create um, some obstacles? Well, the blood brain barrier is essentially a, a gate. Um, that separates the blood from the brain tissue. And the reason, the rationale to do that is it's evolutionarily preserved in case you get bit, for example, from a venomous spider, perhaps that venom, when it gets into your bloodstream, won't get into your brain because it's blocked by the blood brain barrier. And therefore your brain is protected. We actually know, we learned about the blood brain barrier at autopsy of jaundice patients. And they found that at autopsy, a person with jaundice from, let's say, liver failure, every organ was yellow except the, the brain. And the reason for that is uh, Billy Rubin was not able to you know, pass through the blood-brain barrier. So that's a little bit of the history of the blood-brain barrier. Well, it's good to have a blood-brain barrier if you get bit by a poisonous spider, uh, but it's bad if you want to get drugs into your brain. For example, if you have a brain cancer, a brain metastasis, Alzheimer's disease, or stroke. So we need to circumvent safely uh, the blood-brain barrier to deliver chemotherapeutics into the, the human brain. Glioblastomas are the most deadly form of brain cancer. Can you tell us about the other challenges around treating patients with these, this illness? Yeah, glioblastoma is a universally fatal disease. The median survival is about 12 to 15 months. That means 50% of patients live shorter than that and 50% of patients live longer than that. And not only do we not understand the basic biology uh, to a large extent about brain cancer, particularly glioblastoma, as we've talked about, the blood-brain barrier is an inherent uh, problem that we must circumnavigate to get drugs through the, into the brain. So it is a significant problem. And it, you know, it's also what we call an orphan disease. You know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and everyone's wearing pink. There are hundreds of thousands of patients with breast cancer that are living with breast cancer. The number of glioblastoma patients is only 13,000 per year in the United States. And so when you have small numbers, it doesn't generate the interest or enthusiasm, not only from commercialization and a marketing perspective to generate awareness, but whether it's the NIH uh, giving research dollars or biotechnology investing, it's not a hot space in that it's a clinical unmet need that needs a lot more funding and a lot more awareness. So we're working hard to make May uh, uh, go gray in May is our uh, brain tumor awareness month. And uh, the NIH has helped to give a lot of our drugs and devices orphan drug status meaning that they can expedite the treatment. And again, our patients, um, we, we just have, we're fortunate to have uh, an institutional review board that sits at the Feinstein Institutes that is safe and sound and allows, allows us to translate our um, novel research into novel clinical trials for our patients uh, with glioblastoma. You're working on a really interesting clinical trial right now, which attempts to address the problem that the blood-brain barrier presents when treating brain cancers like glioblastomas. It's a really interesting approach that actually uses belly fat. Tell us about that. Uh, we have something that covers our, our abdominal organs. So your organs, your small intestine, your large intestine are, fill, are covered by essentially an immunological organ called the omentum. It's basically fat. But it's a, it's a blanket of fat that basically covers our organs. And in that fat are lymphatic nodes or lymph nodes that har harbor all of the immune cells, the T cells, the B cells, the dendritic cells um, in that. And also there's a large blood supply in that piece of fat called omentum. And we use this piece of omentum for other purposes in the head, mostly to improve wound repair in patients that have had radiation, for example, for head and neck cancers. 
So I hypothesized two years ago that perhaps we can use this same piece of tissue and harness the blood supply and the immune cells that are in it and actually improve our treatments for patients with brain tumors. And the rationale is when I take out a brain tumor, can I take some of this from my